Greetings in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the New Year Bible Broadcast on Church Media TT, the YouTube channel. We continue to encourage you to subscribe because we do know that once you are able to subscribe, you will have a lot of information coming your way that will be able to help you as we read, search, and study the Word of God together. Certainly, it is a wonderful opportunity to get into the Word and to search because we want to be able to find answers to the many questions we may have. And this platform has been created. This is an evangelistic platform so that once you encourage your friends and your neighbors and everyone to, to subscribe and to tune in, we'll be able to study the Word of God together on a busy day or a busy morning such as this. We do know that every opportunity given to search and to read and to study is important. All right, so we are thankful for you joining us. Before we go further into our lesson this morning, could you kindly join with me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, as we approach your divine throne of grace, we continue to ask for your mercies to be extended towards us. And we continue to acknowledge your presence because without you, Father, we are nothing. We are thankful for this beautiful day and for you allowing us the opportunity to meet even at this time, whereby we can learn and study your words. We pray for all those who are viewing, all those who are listening, that their hearts may be open towards the truth of your words and that we, Father, will be able to embrace and be obedient. Thank you once again for this divine privilege as we ask this prayer in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. I continue to acknowledge that Brother Mahes is doing a wonderful job in presenting the word to help us understand the importance of the covenant. And then we started talking about the law. And the question was asked, is the law of God and the law of Moses the same? We were able to go back into the Old Testament and took that journey, that trail, that pattern to see, certainly by the scriptures presented, that the law of God and the law of Moses is the same. When we came to the New Testament, the New Testament even enforces that fact, whether by the Apostle Peter or Paul, as they present very important information to the churches. And so as we continue, I want to be able to look at the gospel according to Matthew. And a gospel according to Matthew, we'll be able to see even Jesus is the one who highlighted the significance and the importance of this law and what is to happen to it. So if I were to just give us a brief introduction, it would simply be this. The purpose of Jesus' coming was already determined before by the prophets. And when the prophets would have spoken, it means that everything that they would have said needed to come to pass. His mission was already outlined in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, where the scripture says that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord had anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Isaiah the prophet spoke about Jesus and his ministry. What was going to happen when he came upon the face of the earth. The gospel according to Luke chapter number 4 verse 18 and 19 speak of the very same thing that Isaiah mentioned in chapter 61 verse 1 and 2. 
Because on that occasion, Jesus was accustomed to go into the synagogue and they would give him the book to read. And as he takes the book, he turns to the pages of Isaiah and he was able to quote the very same thing that we just read in Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. Thereafter, the Bible would have told us in Matthew chapter 4 from verse number 12 that when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And what was he doing? If you come all the way down to verse number 17, he began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As he began to preach, the Bible tells us he was also healing many people of the different diseases and sickness that they would have had, from verse 23 to verse number 25. When Jesus entered into the synagogues, the Bible tells us he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom in verse number 23 of Matthew chapter 4. So what I'm actually getting at is that Jesus actually started preaching and teaching about the gospel and about the kingdom long before anything else would have really taken precedent in regards to the questions that they would have asked him. So, understanding that, we go over to chapter 5 in the book of Matthew. And everybody knows chapter 5 from verse number 1 all the way on to verse number about 12. He talks about the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the pure in heart, uh, blessed are those that are merciful. So he talks about the Beatitudes and all of these things are recorded there for our understanding. Who is Jesus speaking to? The multitude, disciples that come together on the mount. And so in Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6 and chapter 7 is known as the sermon or the first sermon on the mount. And in this first sermon on the mount, Jesus has sought to talk about many things. Like in detail, he would give certain things here, talk about this here and talk about that here. For example, in verse 13 of Matthew 5, he tells them, you are the salt of the earth. And verse number 14, following, you are the light of the world. And then he said in verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see, you know, the good works and glorify God which is in heaven. So when he talks about all of these things, I found it interesting that verse number 17 came right after he mentions about letting your light so shine, being an example to the world. So follow with me, verse number 17, to about verse number 20. It says this, Matthew 5. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Is it not interesting that after all was said in his introductory speech, he comes and he highlights about verse 17, 18, 19, where the law is concerned. And the reason why he did that is because he wanted to be able to show us in the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom that some things was going to change. It was not going to be the same. And his message was to produce in the minds of the hearers that change that is going to come. So he began by saying, think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. In other words, he wants us as he wanted them to consider that the reason why he came could have been several reasons mentioned in scripture rather, but we need to figure out why he made these statements that is so not only predominant, but has and will create a great effect on the hearers. For example, in Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 34, he used these words again, think not, consider that I am come to send peace on the earth? No, I didn't come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. And then he went on further to say, I came to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's fault shall be there with his own household. What is he saying? The purpose for me coming is not really 
to bring peace in that manner, but rather a division. What kind of division? A division that will see people gravitating towards him and the gospel, being obedient, while those who may not be obedient will always disregard the wonderful gospel. He went on further to say in verse number 37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So all of these things indicate that there are going to be divisions in the home because there are those who would want to follow Christ and obey the gospel and there are those who may not. So he says, think not that I am come to send peace. He also said in Mark chapter 1 verse number 38, I came to preach the kingdom of God. I came to preach to those who need to hear the gospel. So besides my coming to serve certain purposes, it must be clear the reason why I am here. Mark chapter 2 verse number 17. He also said, listen, I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. So besides the fact we know that Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for our sins, he mentioned I came not to do certain things that you think I'm here to do, but I also came to do certain things that are very important. And one of those things is Matthew 5 and verse 17. Think not that I'm come to destroy. Now in classical Greek, the word destroy really means to loose or to unloose what was bound before or fastened. But it actually also carries the idea of something that is to be dissolved or to disunite or, or cause something to be untied or to throw down. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus was referring to the temple when he spoke to the disciples and said, Listen, when you look at the building, when you look at the temple and look at these stones, he said, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So the word destroy actually means to dissolve, to overthrow, to throw down. How is it used in the text? It means to render vain, deprive of success, to make invalid or to abolish something in force. Jesus is saying, think not or consider not that I came to destroy the law. I did not come to make invalid or to abolish something in force. What is in force? The law and the prophets. Now to be clear on what Jesus is saying, the word law is usually a code of body of laws in the New Testament referring to the Mosaic code. And that is forming part of the Old Testament which is the law and the prophets. So in Luke 16 verse 16, Jesus also said the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man press it unto it. Now consider what Jesus is saying. That the law and the prophets were until John. So while John was alive and preaching the baptism of repentance, the scripture tells us, that John was put in prison and immediately Jesus started preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. That's interesting for us to find out because why? While John was in prison, Jesus is preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The law and the prophets still existed. But Jesus began. What did he begin? The transition of showing how the gospel is going to now take precedent over the law that's why when he went into the synagogues he was not only there to say to himself that he's observing the practice of gathering together in the synagogues but he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom so so it is in the scripture we learn that jesus is saying i did not come to make invalid or abolish the law and the prophets remember in luke chapter 16 you know the story is told about the rich man and Lazarus, and then when, when the, the rich man died, the, the, he wanted uh, Lazarus to go back from the dead and, and go to his family and, and teach them about the ways that they're living is not the right way. And then Abraham said, listen, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Could you imagine that? He said, no, Father Abraham, if one went from the dead, they will repent. He said, no, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. So, Moses and the prophets, the law, it was existing all the way up until the time of John when the gospel of the kingdom was being preached because there's something was going to change 
and the mind of, and the heart of the people was being diverted in a particular direction. To so hear what Jesus said. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That's interesting, isn't it? I did not come to destroy, I did not come to make invalid or to abolish what is in force, but I actually came to fulfill. And that word fulfill means to bring to a full end, to accomplish, to complete, to make perfect. So it is used in this sense, to bring to the realization how the law ought to be lived. So Jesus Christ came for that purpose. One, to bring to the realization how the law ought to be lived. Because remember, the Jews had their own concept of living this law. They included traditions and, and customs and they mingled everything together. And they brought rules and regulations in which they themselves were not able to lift a finger to do as the scripture says. So then therefore Jesus came to teach them how to live in accordance to the law. Remember Luke the writer says in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 1, all that Jesus began both to do and teach, he told Theophilus that, do and teach. So one of the priority things that Jesus did was to help people to realize how the law ought to be lived. And then he said this, I came not to destroy the law, I came not to make invalid or to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill, to, to accomplish it, to, to bring it to that completeness or end. And he says, till heaven and earth pass, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be filled. I find this also to be very interesting because if you want to see the shift and the change from the old covenant to the new, from the old testament to the new, here's Jesus making another profound statement. Till heaven and earth pass. Till is an adverb, and the word until is a preposition. Now, how does that work within the text? It means as long as, or marking the continuance of an action up to the time of another action. Now, I find that to be very interesting because when I read Matthew chapter number 2, I want to give an example. In verse number 13, it says this. When they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring the word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So when he arose, he took the young child, his mother, by night, and departed into Egypt, and he was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So he was supposed to be there until Herod died. Now the question is, when was Herod going to die? Did we know when Herod was going to die? No, we don't have an understanding when that was going to happen. But he was to remain there until, in verse 19 to 21, when Herod was now dead, the angel of the Lord came to Joseph again in a dream and said, listen, arise, take the young child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who were seeking the child's life, they are now dead. There's a period of time between Joseph leaving to go to Egypt, to hear the announcement of Herod's death for the angel to come and say to him, now you can go back. So that tells us as long as marking the continuance of an action up to the time of another action, he would not be able to leave until Herod would have died. And so in the same text of Matthew 5, 18, you understand that Jesus came not to make invalid or to abolish the law and the prophets because it's supposed to exist until a certain time, until the time of another action to take place, until something else comes into force. For example, Mark, Mark chapter 9, verse number 1. Will I say unto you that there be some of them stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. So some of the Jews were going to remain alive in the time when Jesus was preaching about the kingdom so that when the kingdom come they will know, hey, the kingdom is here. There was a period of time. And therefore, till heaven and earth, he says, pass, that message of the kingdom was going to be preached while the law and the prophets were still in force. So one jot or one tittle is used to express the smallest 
or the minutest part of something being the smallest or ninth letter of the Greek alphabet. It is translated jot and refers to the Hebrew yod, the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So Jesus used it of the little lines or projections by which the Hebrew letters in other respects similar or differ from one another. In other words, not even the minutest part of the law shall perish. Hmm. So that tells us something. That every part of the law, in word, in letter, in diacritical markings, in accents, every part of the law was going to be accomplished before anything else was to happen. And so, when you use the term, till all be fulfilled, in Matthew 5, 18, he says, it is used to indicate that these are words of declaration, meaning to pass away without fulfillment. So everything written in the law, everything written in the prophets, will come to pass, will be fulfilled, because it was supposed to accomplish what was said in relation to Jesus Christ. So I hope in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17 following, you understand that when Jesus talks about the law and he talks about the fulfillment of this law it then means when you read from verse 21 to 48 you know what he says you have heard that it was said by them of old time thou shalt not kill and in the whole of matthew chapter 5 from verse 21 all the way down to verse number 48 you would hear these words you have heard that it was said by them of old time thou shalt but then he comes in the next verse and says but i say unto you what does that mean I am the authority. I am the one that is speaking now. So regardless of what the Old Testament have said, I am. I am the New Testament. I am the authority being spoken at this time. So then, the most important question we need to ask ourselves is this. When will the law be fulfilled? Is it when Christ comes again, the second time? Has the law already been fulfilled? And if so, when? Well, we learn that in scripture that the law was fulfilled when Jesus Christ died on the cross. Hebrews chapter number 9 from verse 15 following. We learned in Luke chapter 16 verse 16 and 17 the same thing. That the law and the prophets were until John. So the transition had begun. And the gospel according to Matthew 5 and Luke 16 indicates to us that there was a time in which the law was going to come to an end because Jesus would have been able to accomplish it, to complete it, to fulfill it, making room for the new covenant which has better promises because it's under the mediator who is Jesus Christ. So I'm looking forward to share with you the next lesson that focuses on that same thing. What happens now with this first covenant today? Let's look at the scriptures that the scriptures will be able to share that wonderful lesson. So once again, thank you for staying with us here on the New Year Bible Broadcast on the YouTube channel. And we pray that you would look forward to the next lesson as we get more into the scriptures under the subject, the two covenants. Believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. What the Bible tells me, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. That he died on Calvary, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he came to set me free in me So I might live with him in glory I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe What the Bible tells me, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he died on Calvary, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe that he came to set the free in peace. So I might live with him in glory.